Hi guys, Kelsey from RoughandTumbleFarmhouse.com and today we're going to talk about processing our steer on farm. A little bit of a different video this week just because it was filmed over the course of almost two weeks at this point now there were a lot of different kind of moving parts and pieces and also trying to be delicate and respectful of the fact that animal processing is can be kind of an emotional thing for people it certainly is for me and trying to be sensitive to that and not showing too much but still showing enough that it is an informational and educational for people so what this video is not, it is not a very specific of how to process a steer on farm, but I am going to talk about some of the things that you want to think about before you get into that process. If you want something that will really take you through step by step of how to make cuts and things like that, there are other YouTubers who cover that. I just want to explain to you what you might want to think about before you dive into this process and talk a little bit about some of the tools that might be helpful to have on hand and also just kind of continue sharing the journey of us on our farm because this has been uh, something that started you know back when the steer was born and has been something we've been working through since then. So before you process an animal on farm, there's a lot of things you want to think about. There's a lot of reasons why you might want to, a lot of reasons why you might not want to. At our farm, it really wasn't even a choice exactly because processors are so backed up right now just because of the craziness of the world. And so we weren't able to get a processing date for him. We called, I think, in April or May of this last year and there weren't any dates available for a full calendar year. And that's within like a two hour range of hauling him somewhere. So it became a question of economics. We simply could not afford to feed a steer for an entire winter. So we decided to reach out to a friend who has a lot of processing experience and then process him on farm. Now some reasons, some reasons why processing on farm is a really good idea. There are a lot of positives to doing it. I mean, there's a lot you have to think through before you're gonna process on farm, but the biggest positive for me is that the animal doesn't have to go anywhere. They don't have to go on a scary trailer ride. There's not the stress of loading, the ride, going to some scary place they've never been before that smells like blood. It's a much less stressful thing. For our, our steer, Blue, he was out in the pasture. We let him into kind of more of an enclosed area in the sheep shed. He was munching on hay. It was one shot and he was done. He honestly didn't even know it was coming um, and it was over, which was really big for me because it I, I don't take eating meat lightly. It is something that we try and do as responsibly as possible. We aren't wasteful at all. And so I think that that's a huge benefit is just for the peace of the animal. Some other reasons for processing on farm can be that you know you are getting your meat back when you take meat into a processor. Hopefully it's a good processor that you trust and have a good relationship with so you know you're getting your meat back. But it'd be a real shame to spend the effort and money and time of raising an animal naturally and then just having it mixed in with other people's meat potentially. Another positive about processing on farm is you don't have to transport the animal anywhere. We don't have a stock trailer and so if we want to move anything bigger than a sheep or a goat we have to borrow a trailer from a friend. So that's something you don't have to worry about either when you're processing on farm. Some other things to think about if you are trying to determine if you want to process an animal on farm is do you have the skills to do this? If you've never done it before, I really, really recommend having someone who has experience with processing animals be there to go through the process with you because it, you know, if you butchered, I butchered chickens on my own. That's not something that really stresses me out. I have assisted with uh, pigs, goats, and now with a steer. So all, everything's kind of sort of the same. It's all kind of a similar process, but there's still some things that it's, I think it's really important to have someone with who knows what they are doing, at least the first time you're gonna do this. Talking about what we're up to today. It's a day I've been dreading for about a year and a half. It's a day that we're gonna be processing our steer. It's always tough when it comes time for these sort of days. Uh, like I said, I've been dreading it since I saw that he was a boy when he was born. So yeah, about a year and a half, I've been just like, every single day just feeling a little bit uh, of guilt and sadness knowing that it's coming. You know, a good friend of mine, I just processed their pigs and she was made a really nice post about it on Facebook on their farm page talking about how, you know, it shouldn't be a thing where we feel guilt or sad, but we should really more so focus on the gratitude. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do today. You know, we we raise a little bit of our own meat um, just kind of with chickens. Chickens I don't have quite as quite as hard a time with. It's still, you know, recognizing the fact that the life is being sacrificed for us to have this food. And so I think it's really important 
Honestly, I wish everybody who ate meat would have to experience this sort of a thing at least once in their lives, just so you really understand you know, the magnitude and what had to happen for you to have that meat on your plate. So um, we really do believe that you know, raising our own meat and buying local meat does have less of an impact on the uh, environment and on people and, and that it's just better in general. Doing like a strict kind of vegan diet or something, absolutely no offense or judgment on someone if if uh, you think differently, that's perfectly fine. But for us, this is what we feel is how we can support our local economies and, and support an agriculture system that, that really fosters regenerative agriculture that's caring for the land and for animals and for people and the well-being of the planet and our communities and, and things like that. So it's, again, it's not an easy choice, but it's one that we've made. Though there are definitely days where I think, let's do vegetarians. I just can't, I can't handle it. Uh, which is which is why I'm grateful we have a friend who is uh, coming over to do the processing for us. We're gonna do a ton of, uh, of, of logging, obviously nothing um, leading up to things, but, but I will kind of show you some of the, the parts of processing. There are some other great YouTubers and homesteaders who, if you're really interested in seeing the how-to of processing an animal, have got great videos out there. I'm just not going to dip my toe into that because it's already a tough day and I just don't want to document that much, <laughs> that much of it, honestly. But I just thought it was important to share, you know, we are talking about our farming experiences and this is a part of, if you are raising your own meat, a real re a reality <laughs> of raising your own meat. And uh, I just think it's important that people kind of understand that and, and understand the perspective coming from small farmers who are raising their own their own meat. We won't eat you though, Gary, I promise. We'll keep you around. Our steer, we grazed over at a neighbor's house pretty much when the grass came and we moved him over there so we could you know, get him off of his mom and we just don't have enough grass here. We, we have to do very creative grazing and I just have enough you know, to feed our two cows and our little herd of dairy goats. So we just don't have enough space to graze another cow. So she has more grass and she can use, and she has sheep and cows and sheep kind of, you know, eat a little bit different stuff sometimes. So we, <laughs> it worked out well to just have him over there. So that's where I'm headed. And, um, you know, we'll hang the meat this morning and let it cool. That's what we're gonna do. And I'll just kind of bring you along as best I can, uh, as much as I can handle anyway, <laughs> bring you along as best I can uh, today for our processing day. All right, it's about a week later. We are now gonna be further processing our beef. Uh, we let it hang for about a week because the weather turned out to be pretty nice. Ideally, you wanna let it hang two weeks to 30 days is really even best, but we just didn't quite have that flexibility. So we're gonna be processing it here and I'll show some footage of that. So just a disclaimer, if you aren't into this sort of a thing, we are gonna be seeing now from here on out animal parts. So if that's not part of your lifestyle or something that offends you, I totally get it. So just now's the time to probably click on off. So you can see here, this is filmed through the back of the pickup window that I was driving. We had the meat hung on kind of the open side of our neighbor's sheep shed. That's Andy there. He is a small farmer extraordinaire, talented in many different areas, and so he was kind of leading the process for us. And then that's my neighbor Brittany over there on the right uh, where we grazed him. And so here, after we hung the meat, we just had to cut them and transport them up to where we we're going to process some more. Here is Andy, and I honestly can't remember if he is cutting roast here or if he's just cutting off some extra meat so we boned out quite a bit of the meat which means just slicing meat away from the bone meat that's not good for kind of roast or steaks and then that meat here you can see Brittany is putting it through the meat grinder we had to run it through twice for ground beef we just used the biggest plate on the grinder the grinder said it does about three pounds per minute and here I am then taking that ground beef and packaging it up. I really recommend if you're gonna be using freezer paper, of course, to get the stuff that is waxed. We had some of the kind that was just brown, didn't have that extra coating, and we definitely had some more leakage issues. But there you can see me packaging and then labeling up that beef. Here, Andy is showing where you would cut your steaks from. We did end up cutting some steaks, not a lot. One half we did into steaks, and then the other half we just cut into large roasts, which of course we can make into steaks later if we want to. And here it was getting dark by the time we were wrapping up. You can see this isn't all the meat. A lot more came after that still. So if you are gonna process an animal on farm, there's a couple of things that you really wanna make sure you have. First of all, you need to make sure you have proper equipment to do this. We have an electric meat grinder. If you wanna try doing the grinding by hand, I mean, God, good luck and Godspeed, because it could not be easy to do that much 
meat that you're gonna get off of a beef animal. My electric meat grinder says that it does three pounds per minute and we also had to double grind and that was probably the most time consuming part of processing the animal was grinding for making ground beef, which you end up with a lot of cuts of meat that aren't gonna be steaks, that aren't gonna be roast, that are gonna be ground. So that's something to keep in mind. There might be a processor near you who is willing to just grind it up, but if your processors are crazy booked up like ours are, then that might not even be an option. So I really recommend having an electric meat grinder. You also wanna make sure you have the proper knives for doing this. Just pulling knives out of your butcher block is not going to cut it. You also want to make sure you have paper for wrapping the meat and also freezer tape. And you wanna use freezer paper. I really recommend having the stuff that's waxy on one side because just the, the non-wax paper, you're gonna have some leakage issues. Another thing you really wanna think about before processing on farm is how you're going to hang that meat. It's important that meat has, I'd say bare minimum, like two weeks to hang, ideally two weeks to 30 days to have that meat hang in a cool area so that way the proteins can break down, the muscle can stretch, you're gonna have much uh, more tender meat, especially if you are raising something that is grass-fed. Another thing really to think about before processing on farm is what are you going to do with the parts you can't use. So we really worked very hard to use as much of this deer as humanly possible. The hide was kept by a neighbor and she's gonna be tanning it. The, a lot of the bones were kept for making stock or for giving to animals to chew on. We really kept all of the, the, the fat for rendering down for tallow, which I'll have a link below to a blog post about how you can render tallow. But there are still a lot of kind of inner parts that you're not going to be using. So getting into the nitty gritty here, so if you're kind of sensitive, just a heads up about things like intestines, um, spleens, you know, just all that extra stuff. And when you are processing a ruminant, you're going to be blown away if it's your first time how much of the animal is the rumen. That stomach is massive. And so with our steer, what we did is after that was removed, we cut it open, dumped the contents, the neighbor's chickens were able to, you know, just snack on that and kick that all around. Not a big deal, it's mostly just a fermented grass, but you still have a lot of tissue that needs to be managed and dealt with. So do you have a proper way of disposing of the parts that you aren't going to use? Now they can certainly be composted, it might be legal for you to bury them. So just make sure you're doing it in a proper way and that you have the ability to do that. Lastly, you're gonna need a way to move around meat and the leftover parts. So for us, we did a lot of elbow grease and we also use my pickup and then we also use kind of a, like a wheelbarrow cart sort of a thing at the neighbors to move around parts that we were disposing of. So that's it, thank you very much for joining me for this video. I know it was kind of all over the place. Uh, it's a trickier process to film than I realized going into it, but again, I thought it was really important that I share this aspect of farm life with you. And I hope that you found it interesting and educational and helpful if you are considering processing an animal on farm. You can always check back here at my channel every single week for new videos about farming, family, food, and fortitude here at our rough and tumble farmhouse.